Hey there, Paul Street, Paul Street Report. It's two in the afternoon, it's Saturday, September 14th. I wanted to say a few things about um, revolution. My readers, my listeners here have been hearing me throw the word revolution around a lot, identifying myself with revolutionary communism, using the phrase revolution, nothing less, all of that. Well, let me get into a little bit into that. I think in this and my next, or perhaps my next two uh, videos, I'm going to... Um, going to spend some time on this topic. What is a desirable revolution worth having? What does an actual Marxist uh, with their head screwed on, right, mean when they advocate revolution? I know a few Marxists so-called with their heads screwed on wrong. What specifically is a socialist revolution? Why do we need a socialist revolution? What does it mean to say communist revolution? Why should the socialist, why should the socialist revolution, as I would argue, be communist led and communist in orientation. What's revolutionary from a socialist and communist perspective? What's not revolutionary? And today, my opening question, what's a revolution? Literally, what's a revolution? I'm going to get started on addressing um, all these questions today, focusing above all right now on that very last question. What is a revolution? And a lot of times, I've done this with capitalism. I've done this with socialism. Uh, when I do a topic, I like to literally go to Webster's online and get their definition and then work off their definition and how much it does fit and doesn't fit with what I'm talking about. This is the word revolution, that I, how it's defined on Webster's online. Uh, and I looked at it this morning. One, okay, eight things, so bear with me. An action, the action by a celestial body of going around in an orbit or elliptical course. Two, the time taken by a celestial body to make a complete round of its orbit. Three, the rotation of a celestial body on its axis. So obviously the first three are talking about astronomy. Four, a changeover in use or preference, especially in technology, as in the computer revolution or the foreign car revolution. Five, a sudden radical or complete change. Six, a fundamental change in political organization, especially, Webster says, the overthrow or renunciation of one government or ruler and the substitution of another government or ruler by the governed. Seven, activity or movement designed to affect fundamental changes in the socioeconomic situation, says Webster's. And finally, eight from Webster's online, a fundamental change in the way of thinking about or visualizing something, a change of paradigm. When I was an undergraduate at Northern Illinois University, Carl Perini used to make us read uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which is all about the historical rise and fall of different scientific paradigms. Well, we can get rid of the first three definitions right away. They're about astronomy and the movement of bodies in space. Now, just quickly, any genuine Marxist has great respect for serious scientific endeavor, including astronomy and physics. And uh, by the way, that should be regardless of scientists' ideological uh, worldview or class or other social origins or identity or sexual orientation. Object of physical reality, Newton's laws of motion, the universal law of Gravitation, the laws of thermodynamics do not have a race or a gender or a class or a political party affiliation or a sexual orientation. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. And by the way, if you ever look at uh, Frederick Ingalls' marvelous, I'll put it up in the notes, graveside uh, speech after the death of Karl Marx, he, he, he begins immediately with referring to Marx as a man of science and a great respecter of science who followed every great scientific development of his time, including uh, the theory of evolution enunciated by Charles Darwin at around the same time that Marx was writing Capital. Um, and Marx didn't give a flying fuck about the ideological perspective of, 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 of scientists. He valued science uh, in and of itself. But anyway, I digress. Um, so, the fourth definition in Webster's new technology, I think, gets us a little closer to the topic since it is human beings 
and social organization that create technologies. And new technologies can and often do have significant impacts on and implications for human society and activity. Look at how steam-powered cotton spinning and weaving transformed the lives of untold millions of people during the first industrial revolution in the early 19th century. Look at how electricity, internal combustion, the assembly line and aviation brought into being the second industrial revolution and the previously unimaginable horrors of modern warfare in the late 19th and the 20th centuries. Look at how supercargo jet transport and container technology and satellites and the internet um, have um, um, brought about corporate globalization and shaped uh, corporate globalization. Look at how nuclear power and weaponry have menaced humanity and shaped uh, global politics and warfare for the last near uh, eight decades. I could go on and on. Obviously, technology is a re real big deal, but a real socialist revolution isn't a new technology any more than it's a new way of making a hamburger. Among other things, it's a fundamental change in the social milieu and context within which technology is used and in the purpose for which technology is applied and indeed how it is designed when you really get down to it. So <clears throat> it's not a technology, the revolution I'm talking about that we're talking about as revolutionary Marxists is not uh, just a, a technological change, obviously. Number five is interesting. A sudden radical or complete change, uh, says Webster's online. Well, I think one third of that is on point with socialist revolution. The part that fits is radical. And for socialist revolutionary communists, that means the radical replacement of capitalism with revolutionary socialism, both in the um, underlying material economic system and in the political and intellectual superstructure atop that underlying material mode um, of production. Revolutions always start in the superstructure. A socialist revolution move, would then move down into the capitalist mode of production and radically replace that mode of production with a new uh, socialist one. A sudden change doesn't really fit. A bridge, there's, a, there, there's nothing inherently has to be sudden about a revolution. A bridge suddenly collapses. A gun suddenly shoots. My right knee suddenly buckles. Um, obviously not a revolution. The Reichstag fire suddenly burning in Berlin becomes the pretext for a great fascist and anti-revolutionary, counter-revolutionary uh, dictatorship. Now, every socialist revolution has had a particular uh, dramatic moment, which might seem sudden, like Lenin's pronunciation uh, at the Smolny Institute in Moscow on November 7th, 1917. Let us proceed to build the new socialist order, kind of an announcement of the victory of a Bolshevik revolution and its intentions to make a new type of society. So it's always those moments when the new order is won and proclaimed. But revolutions always develop over time, over considerable periods of time. And socialism in power is always a long-term proposition if it involves continuous popular political leadership struggle if the revolution is not going to fail and be undone and if the bourgeois revolution is not if the socialist revolution is not to become in essence a bourgeois revolution slip back into capitalism complete change also doesn't really fit for socialist revolution, for the desirable socialist revolution. Uh, that's because class and other inequalities and oppression structures, and along with that, reactionary and anti-revolutionary worldviews and ideologies and cultures do not mystically and completely disappear after a socialist seizure of power. Obviously, certainly true in 20th century Soviet Russia and Mao's China. Thinking they do disappear overnight is simply magical thinking. Such comprehensive overnight evaporation 
is impossible. It's just historically unsustainable thing to happen. And I've had to say this to liberals who tell me that when I say revolution, that I that I think that, that I think you just snap your fingers and everything would be different. That's insane. Nobody thinks that. No serious Marxist thinks that. Marx didn't think this. So the, really, the, the one who took uh, the, the, the understanding that the revolution is the beginning of a, of, a, of a struggle to the furthest point in the 20th century was, of course, Mao. That's a lot of what the attempted cultural uh, revolution, which, by the way, gets a lot of left intellectuals, undies, all up in a bunch to even mention the cultural revolution. But that's what the cultural revolution was about, was Mao's understanding, about, among other things, of the, the need for continuous struggle, that the socialist revolution is only the beginning of the transformation of political consciousness and mass culture and so forth. So, you know, a complete tr transcendence of class oppression and indeed of all forms of exploitation of one part of society by any other part of society is something, that kind of complete transformation, if we want to call that complete, uh, that is something that emerges only under communism whose slogan is from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. And I always like to say about that core communist slogan, which I think was invented by Marx, is that needs needs to be need needs need to be understood as something much more than just the meeting of, of, of a need immediate material needs, you know, food, clothing, and shelter. Artistic needs, cultural needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs. Now, that complete change, communism, doesn't happen under socialism, but it is a profoundly desirable long-term outcome, and making that the goal of a socialist revolution is the very purpose, the heart and soul of a communist vanguard, of a communist party, of a real communist party, a revolutionary communist party. And, you know, I always say it's kind of silly that, we, that the revolutionary communist party has to call itself a, the, a revolutionary communist party, right? Isn't being a communist by definition revolutionary? Well, unfortunately, no, it isn't, thanks to the historical experiences of the uh, rather pathetic and revisionist and uh, uh, and bourgeois accommodating communist parties of the 20th century in uh, Western Europe and the United States, and of course, um, elsewhere. Let's look at Webster's definition number six of a revolution. A fundamental change in political organization, especially the overthrow or renunciation of one government or ruler and the substitution of another by the governed. Now, this has some partial positive relation to a real desirable socialist revolution, but on the whole, it falls very short in my opinion. A desirable socialist revolution, and I'm starting to acronymize that as DSR, a DSR, a desirable socialist revolution, would absolutely, yes, involve a fundamental change in political organization, the replacement of a political system that represents and institutionalizes the societal dominance, the rule of the modern capitalist ruling class, and more importantly, the capitalist system. A socialist, a DSR would involve the replacement of that ruling class and its system by what Marx called the dictatorship of the proletariat, meaning a socialist government empowering the people and replacing the profits regime and empire with the political and economic system that privileges the common good and, and long-term human emancipation, ultimately from all forms of exploitation and oppression, that it privileges those things over and above individualistic profit pursuit and getting over on other people and the rat race. But that change, you know, from one government or ruler to another government or ruler is something much deeper and far more wide ranging than the substitution of rulers. 
one group of rulers for another group of rulers. I guess I'm repeating myself a little bit. Oh, there goes my dog. Some dogs are barking outside. You are probably now about to hear my dog barking in the back. Oreo, please. I'm talking about revolutionary communism here. She doesn't care. So it's a much bigger change than that, right? The socialist revolution, the DSR, the desirable socialist revolution, is about a fundamental radical and qualitative change in the purpose and the nature of government. It's about the change involved in an actual socialist revolution, and that means reaching down below the political superstructure to radically transform the underlying economic base, that is, the mode of production. So that's very different, I think, than Webster. So Webster gets a C- minus on that. It doesn't flunk, though, at least from the criterion of socialist revolution. Or desirable socialist revolution, D D desirable socialist revolution, DSR. Uh, <laughs> I love acronymizing things. Number seven, Webster's, may get us a, a bit closer to the DSR. Quote, activity or movement designed to affect fundamental changes in the socioeconomic situation. Now, I've already said what the fundamental change in economic life would be, or the socioeconomic situation, a shift from the capitalist profits regime to socialist production for the common good on the path to human emancipation for all. Still, the word, but the, the but the wording here. So that's a change in the socioeconomic situation. But the wording here is very vague and very weak. Webster's wording here is very vague and very weak. Revolutionary socialists and communists, I think, will would replace in this definition situation with system. They think that the fundamental change required must be understood as something far beyond piecemeal reform of the existing system. It seems like the Webster's definition leaves open just about any possible reform. But, well, for a revolutionary socialist, communist, uh, the fundamental change we're talking about is not about an expansion of the social safety net or an enhancement of workers' right to form unions and win contracts or an increase in taxes on the rich. I can't tell you how many times I've heard purportedly radical leftists say, tax the rich, tax the rich, tax the rich. Tax the rich, that means you're still presupposing the continued existence of the rich, right? You want them around so that you can tax them. No, we want to get rid of the system that creates the absurdity of 1% of the population having as much wealth as the bottom 90%. That system is called capitalism, imperialism. No, so, you know, revolutionary socialists, communists seeking a DSR are not trying to put lipstick on the pig of capitalism and imperialism. As actual radicals, they want to go down to and tear up the very taproot of modern exploitation, ecocide, imperialism, class rule, and alienation. They want to go to the taproot of all that. And that, my friends, is the anarchic and pathological ecocidal capitalist mode of production with its many imperialist overlays. Look, Looking at the Boeing Corporation strike underway right now, as I write this, I think real revolutionary socialists and communists note correctly with disdain that Boeing workers, unfortunately, are not rising up against the use of their labor power to construct lethal weapons of mass destruction for the ruthless oppression of millions, nay, billions of people worldwide, but are seeking instead rather more. The Oliver Twist demand, more, sir, please, more. They want more stuff, money, goods, from the fucking sick capitalist empire that is working actively in accord with the very sick logic of its underlying mode of production to cancel all prospects for a decent human future on Earth through environmental destruction and potentially through global war, terminal in nature in the nuclear era. 
I just saw on the news today that Putin has yet again tried to get the West to understand you keep fucking antagonizing us on our long southwestern border. You're 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 risking nuclear fucking war, you idiots. I like number eight. It's a chain the, the notion of a change in paradigm in a way of thinking. Now, when Webster says that, when they say paradigm, they're thinking of scientific paradigms as in the leap from Newtonian to Einsteinian physics. But a DSR, a desirable socialist revolution, involves the determined effort to spread new ways of thinking about human history and society and about humanity's relationship to the world, including a shift from competitive, selfish, me-first, rat race individualism and intimately related bourgeois, dark notions of human nature and and bourgeois explanations of inequality and human conflict and bourgeois celebration of the human domination of the natural world, which is impossible because nature bats last and we're finding that out right now. Yeah, completely different ideas. So the socialist revol- the desirable socialist revolutions involved the propagation, uh, um, the spread of completely different ideas um, about what it means to be human and how to live in the material, social, and political world. The ruling ideas of any age, as Karl Marx said, are the ideas of the ruling class. Material class dominance of the economic system uh, brings class dominance historically across the ideological superstructure. A desirable socialist revolution, a communist-led socialist dictatorship, yes, dictatorship, sorry, of the proletariat. One that has learned, I hope, in the 21st century from both the very real accomplishments and the very real mistakes of 20th century socialist states, Soviet Union, Mao's China, that kind of revolution would spread new ways of understanding human history and society and of uh, humanity's relationship to the natural environment of which us humans are such a critical and wild car component. That's it pretty much for me today <clears throat> on the questions I posed at the outset in my next reflection. I want to get into why we need a socialist revolution, what it means to say communist led socialist revolution why socialist revolution needs to be communist-led and communist in orientation. I'm guessing it will take me a third reflection to get into what's to be done that is revolutionary and what is often done and said that is not revolutionary, that is anti-revolutionary. And that's, and, and, and that's a long list of things that unfortunately are very common on what uh, passes for a left. And I look, oh my God, I'm at 23 minutes, so I better stop now. So that's at the beginning of my thoughts on revolution, I'll have another one probably tomorrow. Thank you so much for listening to me today.